Hi, I'm Myra Seha, and you're listening to Venture Unplugged. From deep tech crypto to direct consumer brands and products, each week we dive in deep into the lives and challenges of today's most successful founders and investors. New episodes launch every Tuesday. Sign up for our newsletter at VentureUnplugged.com and subscribe on iTunes or Spotify. Follow me on Twitter at MyraSeha007. I'm so excited about today's episode with Matt Meeker, the founder of Meetup.com and BarkBox. In this episode, we discuss the insights and challenges of launching and growing two multi-million dollar businesses. This episode is brought to you by Qtim. Qtim is the first proof of stake smart contracts blockchain. It has been around for over two years and has over 4,000 nodes around the globe. If you're tired of paying high fees on other smart contract platforms, head over to qtum.org. That's qtum.org and start building your own low fee Solidity smart contract today. This podcast is co-presented by Blockworks Group and Republic. Blockworks Group is a blockchain events and media production company. For exclusive content and events that provide insight into the crypto and blockchain space, visit them at blockworksgroup.io. Republic is an investment platform that helps companies raise capital from retail investors. For more information, please visit republic.co. Hi, Matt. It's good to see you again. Thanks for having me on today. Yeah, thank you for having me here in your offices in New York City. Now, you're somebody who I've always admired because I love dogs, but I think you love dogs even more, so much so that you even built an entire company called BarkBox. And I'm really excited to dive in deep today on how you built that, but also touching upon your first company, Meetup. So why don't we go ahead and get started maybe from the beginning? Okay, that sounds great. How did the original idea for Meetup get started? Um, it's, it's sort of like this, and I think like any startup, um, I think very few are this moment where you wake up in the middle of the night and you jot it down and you've got it. Um, there's not that, that spark, but it's a few different things coming together. And so the, one of the big inspirations at the time was, um, the, the aftermath it's funny today's uh oh, today's september 10th so um the aftermath of september 11th um we were you know we lived here in new york um scott and i were spending a lot of time together uh, and just walking around the city and thinking about different things that we could do and where the world was going and and then you have this aftermath of 9 11 where the city was very different and people had genuine concern for each other, even though they didn't know each other. A lot of looking people in the eye and asking, how are you? And it's not just a passing comment. I mean, New Yorkers don't even say that to each other now, but they would say it and they actually wanted to hear the answer. So that was a, that was a really good feeling. Uh, and we started to think about how do you, how do you make that feeling happen at scale? And how do you connect strangers to their neighbors? So, across common interests and how do you do it in a, a really meaningful way it's one thing to be connected um, by following someone on twitter and it's another thing to like actually go out and sit down and have a conversation with them so that was a that was a spark um and it was it was that one idea that we just couldn't shake so we kept developing it and it, it became more and more real and uh almost to the day, I think the day it was June thirteenth. Um, so almost nine months later, uh, Meetup was launched. So we we often refer to it as a nine eleven baby. Uh, <laughs> and what were the biggest lessons and challenges that you faced while launching your first company or your first large one, Meetup? <laughs> so many. <laughs> um, a lot of first time experiences there, and some that I felt very direct, and some indirect that Scott had to take on um, first time being part of fundraising um, there there was a very powerful lesson in that for me uh, of it's one thing to get an investor to nod up and down and say yeah I'll, I'll invest and another thing to get them to commit and another thing to get the check um, so you you'd go and you'd have I'm sure a lot of uh, the founders or entrepreneurs who who listen are familiar with having a day of great meetings. I mean, like, oh, everybody loved it. 
and then nothing happens and you're like well wait a minute all those people really liked what we were doing they were encouraging they were positive where's the money where's the check uh, and so closing that gap and and having sincere interest and then even when you do uh, I remember with Meetup we raised the smallest of, of seed rounds I think memory um I, my memory is it's a quarter million dollars which in today's terms is laughable <laughs> uh, but it was from maybe 12 15 individuals and you you can send out all the all the emails in the world and say sign your documents and wire your money and you know 10 percent will do it 20 percent will do it you get the rest who didn't see the email or drag their feet or forget or whatever so we um we had this idea of we started this was right when apple released the ipod i mean weeks after and we sent an email to all those investors and said um i have an ipod with a thousand songs loaded up on it i'm going to come up to your office and i'll trade you your documents and a check and i'll hand you the ipod and they're like, oh, that's awesome. Bring it up. And so go up, hand them the iPod, take the check and walk out. And we closed it so quickly. So a good lesson about that, about fundraising. And what surprised you the most about your customers? What were the funniest meetups that people had? <laughs> the funniest? Yeah. Um, uh, I got in trouble early on for say, saying this out loud, but I can't get in trouble anymore. So <laughs> um, we we would we would say internally that in the early days meetup was built on on the interests of freaks and geeks and uh the we were so off we we had this idea going out that the most popular interests would be those that did the most volume for us so new york yankee baseball the beatles you know popular music that kind of stuff so we we loaded up the platform with that and nothing and the things that took off were witches and wiccans and vampires and pagans and i learned what furries were through me <laughs> wow <laughs> um and then uh, and then i remember going to um a slash dot meetup for those who know what slash dot is it's a really really nerdy tech community online tech community um and that was one of our bigger uh, communities back in the day and I went to the New York one and it was just all these hardcore techies lining the wall like all the way around a, a room like a big room uh, and they were just stuck to the wall nobody was in the middle of the room so a lot of those types of communities and when we step back from it it made total sense um, where it's very socially acceptable to walk into a bar or grocery store, restaurant, whatever, and go up to a stranger and say, hey, are you a New York Yankee fan? That's fine. You can say, yeah, I'm a Yankee fan, or no, I'm a Mets fan, or whatever. You cannot walk up to someone and say, hey, do you happen to be a witch? Um, that's not cool. And so those people had a hard time finding their others. And so we had finally put together something where they could connect with the others like them. And once it was there... They, they used it. Was that the tipping point? Or when did you finally realize there was a business? How long did it take? <laughs> a, bu- uh, a business is a different thing. <laughs> um, the, I think the tipping point for, uh, for the platform, we, we struggled. It, it took off in a popular way. Uh, there was a lot of usage around it early on, um, and engagement around it, and realization in, that people are good. And it's it's okay to do this and then there was a lot of mainstream media that would try to beat it down and tell people that the internet is a scary place and it's dangerous to meet people that you connect to online and you're going to be killed or your kids are going to be kidnapped Um, so we had to fight against that really really hard Um, probably for about i don't know our first year year or two uh it was a very, very difficult challenge for us. Um, the thing that turned it and that got the platform overall a lot of popular exposure was politics. And 
at us making a, an arrangement with a, a small Democratic presidential candidate from Vermont who nobody knew named Howard Dean. And Howard Dean and his campaign manager, Joe Trippi, said to us, we want to build the grassroots of this campaign on this platform. And so if you give us the platform to leverage for our campaign, we don't have any money, we can't pay you. But what we can do is after every speech, we will say, join your local Howard Dean meetup. Hmm. And he did. And so as he did, and he became a front runner and very popular, that amplified in a major way. So I think their campaign and our company grew up together. And when and every other presidential campaign quickly followed on because of his success. So it helps a lot when you have nine presidential candidates going out there and talking about using your platform. It gives you legitimacy and it makes all those concerns go away. So that was a big moment. Why did you decide to leave Meetup? Uh, it was just, it was time. So it was uh, about eight years in and we had we had accomplished a lot. So when I left, we were over 10 million active members on the on the platform. We were worldwide in, um, I want to say over 100 countries. Um, the, the platform was growing organically. The activity was really good. The engagement of the, the user was really good. We had sort of cracked the business model and it was profitable. Um, good good amount of cash in the bank it was just running and at that point looking back and saying you know when we started this thing eight years ago if i had said we could have all those things would i be happy with it and absolutely like it had already outstripped every every dream or hope we'd ever had so i didn't feel like there's a whole lot more for me to do there and i also didn't feel I was the person to do it. I'm, I'm more of the, uh, <laughs> I, I guess I like to have self-inflicted pain, but like in the early part and struggle and really trying to figure out the hard problems of get this thing off the ground and get people to engage in it and make the model work and get it all to fuse together. Uh, the next phase is, very, is a very different skill set and I didn't feel like it was mine. So it was time to move. And your current adventure is with BarkBox. How did that concept come about? That came about from uh, my dog, Hugo, who's a great Dane and uh, <laughs> who I'm obsessed with and, and just wanting to make him happy. And because he's a great Dane, he's a bit of an outlier in New York. He's not well served by pet stores who um, serve apartment dogs. 20 pound dogs that uh, are dominant here in New York. And so I really wasn't finding things that I felt were appropriate for him and invented the concept. Um, we were starting to see the subscription box concept as a way of discovery of new products. Birchbox being, I think, the first that we saw and thought, well, that'd be interesting if Hugo could get something that was an assortment of size appropriate toys and treats and chews and things for him every month. That'd be super cool. And I was also in venture and um, seeing a lot more direct to consumer commerce type businesses, but didn't understand how they worked. And so it was, again, that collision of I'm curious about a business model and I want to serve my dog. And so I just want to start something and get the rhythm of it. Maybe we'll serve 100 customers. That'll be okay. Um, never envisioned all of this, but it just took off in a pretty big way. Now, how did this fundraising round go? Uh, well, we haven't raised money for, for uh, over three years now. The initial fundraising, kind of the same thing. Um, I, I thought because I'd been working in venture and my network for the past couple of years had been um, a lot of seed stage investors. It felt like I'm talking to these people all the time. I know what's important to them. A lot of them are my friends. I'll just walk around New York and pick up my <laughs> checks and it'll be easy. <laughs> and it was almost the opposite that because 
you had been having those meetings and hanging out with these people all the time, they raised the bar on you and said, we expect more from you. So it was very, very tough, but um, <laughs> we we got through it and then uh, invented our, my own forcing function there, which was uh, I, I got the verbal commitments and I told everyone, you know, you, you've got to get in. Um, I need your signed paperwork and your check by this date because I'm getting married and I'm leaving that <laughs> Friday. After that, I'm we're, we're starting the company. So people respected that and went along with it. What has surprised you the most about your customers running BarkBox? I imagine at some point you can have too many toys or is that <laughs> assumption incorrect? Uh, no, no, no. That's, uh, that's something we know and we're, we've been... We've done a lot of data work, so we, we actually know when that happens um, for most customers, and so we've been able to adapt so you don't get there or you don't get there soon. But, oh, wow. The, the, the surprising thing to me shouldn't be surprising at all um, because it, it goes back to the root of the story, which was Hugo and him being this outlier. And I think of Hugo as... He's a 135-pound Great Dane. He lives in New York City. Um, now he's a bit of an older guy. He's nine and a half, uh, so he's slowing down. He doesn't play with toys as much, so his needs have changed. Uh, but I think of him as really, really special and really unique. And and so when I started, it was about serving him and, and all of his unique needs. And the surprising thing to me and the thing we've learned over time is um, they're all special and they're all unique and they all have very unique needs and they're changing. Um, and so that's both the challenge and the huge opportunity where um, you can you can make one or two or three toys. You can make a line of toys and go hang them on a retail shelf and have it hang there for a year or two or... Um, you know, the, the Kong toy has been hanging there for 40 years, looking the same, being the same toy. And that's fine. It can be a fine toy, but it's not, it doesn't adapt with your dog. Um, and same for food and same for dental care and same for every product. Every dog has a unique set of needs and they change. You know, you can't, you can't say this diet is for your dog to lose weight. And then when they lose the weight, just keep serving them the same food. You've got to say, like, great, they don't, now they need a different diet. Um, and so we've learned that a dog's needs are, are unique and special, and they're always changing. So we have to be in, in touch with our customer and hearing about their dog constantly, taking that in and then feeding it right back into the product that we serve them. Um, what that translates to is... With BarkBox, we're serving over 600,000 customers a month. And right now we have 135,000 unique assortments that they get. So it's highly, highly personalized, um, which is tough, but, but it's what we'd all want for our dogs. It's interesting that you're looking at the entire life cycle of the dog's lifespan, right? Mm -hmm. And... Have you thought about diversifying into other products? Oh yeah, we we are di diversifying into other products. So we have um, we have one line of products that's out call, that we call Bark Home, and it's essentially looking at <laughs> the the genesis of the idea was uh, you spent people spend all this money going into a William Sonoma Crate and Barrel restoration hardware spend tens of thousands of dollars on making their home look beautiful. And then they go buy bowls and collars and leashes and beds and, and that are ugly and sprinkle them all over the house. And it just makes the whole thing look terrible. So it was just, can we, can we make a line of dog products for the home that, that actually look good and look like they fit in and belong there? Um, uh, the first product we put out was a dog bed. Uh, it's it's doing inc it's been out for just over a year now. It's doing incredibly well, and the second version is coming um, next month. 
and it's also a little bit a little bit of a spoiler here it's coming with um, a whole line of sheets so I think the first sheets for a dog bed ever but it's really cool dog bed sheets that's yeah. interesting <laughs> um, they're awesome too <laughs> um, so bark home is one line um, another another line that we've been working on for about two years and comes out next week yeah we're 10 days away um it's called bark bright and it's a dental product that we've been developing with a pharma company in in europe and that that will go out to all of our subscribers next week so and then there's more in the pipeline but now a quick word from our sponsor In addition to being one of the best smart contracts blockchain in the world, with extremely low fees and easy-to-use platform, QTIM's proof-of-stake system lets anyone stake with as little as a fraction of a QTIM. To learn more and start building today, go to qtum.org. Are there more popular dogs that you have found on your... Or Great Danes? (laughs) Popular breed? (laughs) No, no, they're not. Um, it's, It's interesting, though, that um the popularity of a breed will will surge um after movies so if for example if a pug has shown up like men in black the the pug shows up in the movie and then there will be a surge of pug ownership and so interesting popular culture will definitely drive it one thing that a lot of founders are curious about is really that dynamic between VCs and founders. What has your experience been like? What do you rely on them for? And maybe you have some insights for for our founders. Yeah, we've been we've been very careful and very thoughtful about building our board and who our investors are. Um, Our our first investor slash board member was Mike Hirschland uh, of Resolute. And Mike and I had known each other for a few years. He led our seed round and somehow I convinced him to join the board. And now he probably regrets it because he's still there seven years later. Um, But it's really about the quality of that person. Um, And Mike is someone who I think he would be the first person to say, I don't know anything about operationally how this thing runs. And I'm not going to pretend I know. And I'm not, I'm, he, he's just, he does what he does and he does it very well. And he lets you execute and stays away. But he will also come to a board meeting and ask all the right questions um, to challenge something, but not, not in an aggressive manner. But uh, are we thinking about this kind of way? So very valuable, very supportive all the way through. Um, Right after Mike joined, Stuart Elman from RRE joined our board uh, and led our Series A and B. Um, And Stu's kind of got the same makeup as Mike in that he doesn't uh, he doesn't pretend to know what he doesn't know. Uh, He gets he gets more into it when we're talking about the finance part of things. Um, But Stu and RRE. Are, are fantastic where um, there have been a few key moments where you need an investor or a board member to really step up and they step up. They're always there. They're always there to support you. Um, and I think something I've learned um, with those two in particular is it's it means a lot to have a founder of a firm or a a leading partner of the firm at your table because um, they they have partners that they answer to um, or that they work with and that they respect but they can make a lot of decisions right there on the spot so um, it, it helps a lot that they don't they don't have to go back to committee and convince a lot of people that they can make the best decisions for the company right there and keep you moving forward um, means the world and then uh, we added Trip Jones from August Capital, um, and Trip is more interested and involved in the day to day, and he wants to know how it's going. and uh, And that's what we were actually looking for. We were looking for someone who's more active and was 
thinking about helping us scale. Uh, so on the investor side, it starts with the people who really get what we're doing. Um, you won't find <laughs> you won't find an investor who loves dogs more than Stu, um, <laughs> and Trip loves his dog a lot. Mike um, has always thought this is a stupid idea, but is backing the founder, so that's fine. Um, but it's we have different relationships with all of them, but have been very careful about who we add there. That's great. No, and and I actually know Trep, and I know he's super excited about BarkBox. And um, with that said, where is expansion going from now? I know you mentioned new products, but you've also entered in some unique partnerships, most recently with Glossier, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that just came out this week. Uh, I would expect to see some more like that. So... I never know what I'm allowed to talk about or not. <laughs> I like how you just looked around. <laughs> I know. That, this is where I usually get yelled at. Um, I won't tell. The, so I'll go, I'll go from this angle. Um, we entered retail uh, about two years ago where we, we started bringing all of our products to Target. And that, that's been a great relationship. We've been in all 1,800 Target stores. Um, that relationship expanded uh, in August where we brought our newest line, Super Chewer, to 250 of their stores. It's going really well. Great, great start there. So we'll keep expanding that. We've worked with a lot of other retailers um, over the past two years, probably another 20. Um, It would probably surprise everyone to know that in terms of revenue, our second highest grossing retailer is um, Subaru, and Subaru we make we make toys that look like their cars. Um, we've made one now that's got a little kayak and a and a bicycle that attached to the roof, um, and then they sell those or give those away through their dealerships. And so that's a big big partnership for us and for them, and we love it. It's great, and so. Glossier isn't it isn't quite that big, but another great partnership where we've we've collaborated on a product or two with them. Um, in that spirit, the one that I'm not sure I'm allowed to talk about, but I don't care, is um, we'll start being in Dunkin' Donuts with products um, in October, I think. So wow, uh, yeah, so products like that. So we're doing more and more of those things. Um, we did. We did products with, um, oh man, I'm gonna get killed because I think it's Universal Studios, but if it's not, I'm sorry, but uh, with the Grinch movie last November, and we we did our full holiday box around the Grinch with a lot of different characters. Uh, We had the the antlers that a lot of dogs had to wear and get (laughs) photographed in and they hated it. Um, So I would look for more of those movie type partnerships coming up. We've, we've partnered with the National Women's Soccer League and are, are sponsoring a lot of their a lot of their games and broadcasts. So more sports. Um, I think you'll see a lot more partnerships like that in the next year. Now, you're deeply entrenched into the direct consumer space uh, and the pet retail market. What are your thoughts about the future of retail and where do you think there are opportunities? Uh retail to me is <laughs> is in a tough tough spot um we we also work with amazon and we we sell in the marketplace and we do quite well there uh, and it's so it, it's just incredible to me to see that company and see that opportunity that I'll, I'll bring it back to us, but we have the opportunity every month to send out subscription boxes to over 600,000 customers, hear back from them, what did you like, what didn't you like, um, crunch that data, and then feed it back into what will we send you next month, or, or what other products might you be interested that we can develop and then sell you separately. Um, and we have a, a happy team 
customer support team that's so much more than that who talks to about a third of our customers every month and they're having real conversations learning about their dog and then feeding that back to us saying we should be developing this or making that or there's a subset of customers who want this product and we're able to make it and put it out on the market and start selling it and then hear feedback and adapt and adapt the pricing and the marketing and everything day to day, week to week, very, very naturally. Um, I'll, I'll balance that against our relationship with Target. And, uh, and I don't think this is unique to Target. I think this is retail overall. But I, I mentioned, and by the way, I love Target and we love the relationship. So, uh, but I mentioned we, we launched our product line Super Chewer with Target a month ago. And um, <laughs> there, we knew going into it, we knew here are products that we think are gonna sell really well and here are some eh, we're a little iffy on. I, and it's played out that way where the products we felt strong about are more than doubling what our projections were and the others are about 15% under. And we know it. Now we know it. They know it. You've got enough sales and enough data to say like, yeah, that's significant. It's true. We're stuck. We can't change that until next August. That's just the way it is. Um, because that's the next time they're going to change their store. So we just have, we're just stuck with it. And they're stuck with it. Um, because that's, um, that's the, the infrastructure they've built up and the process they've built up. Where on Amazon, uh, we could pull that product off today and replace it with one of the higher selling products or put more marketing dollars behind the higher selling products and get them more exposure. We could do it today. We don't have to wait a year. So when you can be that responsive to the customer and understand them, communicate with them individually, use data to serve them better, and respond in days instead of years, uh, over time, I, it's already happened in, in a major way, but I think that gap is just going to widen more and more um, over the years. So I don't spend a lot of time thinking about physical retail, but uh, if the asset is your, your exposure or your, um, uh, I guess your stores, then and they probably are thinking a lot about how do we leverage that to become our strength, if that's distribution, if that's um, our, our view. A lot of people ask us, why don't we open a retail store? Um, and we just don't know what we would do unique in a retail store that would draw people in. Just putting our products on shelves doesn't seem to be enough for us. So our view of a retail store is we've started to create parks and we've created dog parks that are um, very, very high end. Uh, you know, there's seating, there's, uh, there are these pods we've built that are both heated and air conditioned. Um, they have a, they have plugs for electricity that there's Wi-Fi. There's, um, there are people that are, are working on it, keeping it safe, keeping it clean. Um, we sell products there. We sell drinks there. So it's more of a, a place to visit in the real world. And then if we wanted to, we could use those for promoting more products. We could use it for distributing products from there. But it's, it, it's about building a destination that's about more than come here to buy product. So, anyway. The dog parks are very fascinating. Where can people find these dog parks and what major cities? There's... There's one today that's in Nashville. Uh, that was our first, and we piloted that last year, and it, it went so well that we reopened. Um, and there's another that's opening on a pop-up basis in Chicago, uh, and I think it's opening very soon. I don't know the date, so we're, um, we're doing it in partnership with the Royal Palms Shuffleboard Club here in Brooklyn. They're opening a spot there, so we're, we're doing it side by side. Um, and then my hope is that pretty soon you will see hundreds of those around the world. 
Thank you so much for sharing that experience. And before we jump into rapid fire questions, I want to end on a happy note with one of my favorite questions, which is, when was your last moment of peak happiness? Of peak happiness? Uh, my, <laughs> I don't know. My peak happiness is just with with my boy, Hugo. Uh, and so <laughs> probably just chasing him around the park on Sunday. Um, he got he got a little burst of energy and I was chasing him and he was running like he was a two-year-old again. So it's cool to see when he's nine and a half. I love that. And so let's jump into rapid fire questions. Are you ready? Yeah. How much do you sleep? Uh, seven, eight hours a night. What is your favorite book? Ooh, um, On Writing by Stephen King. Do you believe in God? Uh, maybe. <laughs> maybe. AI, scary or exciting? Exciting. Exciting, for sure. Who are founders that you admire? Uh, Jeff Bezos, big Amazon fan. Walt Disney, uh, big Disney fan. What is the one thing that you believe in that most people don't? Today, the one thing I, I seem to believe in that most people don't is that the right way to run the company, a company, is uh, by building a profitable business, uh, that you don't go burn a lot of cash and fuel growth in that way. Do you believe you're lucky? Yeah, absolutely. What's the biggest misconception that people have about you? Probably that... Um, Probably that I'm introverted. Do you think of yourself as a success? Yeah. What do you want to be remembered for? Making dogs happy. That's great. Thank you so much for uh, your time today. This is fabulous. And thank you so much for sharing your stories. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much for listening to that episode. New episodes launch every Tuesday at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you want to continue the conversation, you can find me on Twitter at MyraSeha007. And I'll see you next time. 